Okay. So welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by uh, Mario Juric, who's uh, come across to us from uh, Arizona, where he uh, is at the moment, Tucson. Mario did a bachelor's uh, at uh, Zagreb University in Croatia, and then came across to the, uh, to, uh, the US to do a PhD at Princeton. Uh, he was uh, studying with Scott Tremaine, uh, and uh, his, the topic of his thesis was the dynamics of extrasolar planets. After his PhD, he then was enrolled as a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the School of Natural Sciences, uh, where he uh, continued to work on his solar system dynamics work. Uh, and then uh, he went to Harvard as a Hubble Fellow, um, where he began working with large telescopes, and particularly on the PanStars project. After this work, uh, he was recruited by uh, his current project, the LSST project, where he is the data management scientist uh, and responsible for all of the promises made on uh, data management and huge data that we'll be getting back from the LSST. Uh, he's, as I mentioned, he's at the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona. He is responsible for discovering 125 asteroids and uh, at least one comet. Um, of course, we don't know how many of those asteroids might actually be comets, <laughs> so I won't get into that. Uh, the comet is called 183P uh, Kolevich Jurich. And he also took part in the uh, 1999 discovery of the Sloan Great Wall, which is a great wall of galaxies, of galaxy filaments, um, 1.3 billion light years thick. I only mention that because he might not get around to mentioning that in his talk about LSST today. Um, but uh, please join me in welcoming Mario. All right. Thank you, thank you, Adrian, for that introduction. And it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here because, uh, I mean, this place, or actually the people of this place, are partially the reason why I'm doing astronomy. When I was a kid, I was interested in two things. One was riding my bike. The other one was finding aliens. <laughs> and and you know, as, as time went on, I enrolled doing physics. I, I still kept touch with this community and trying, trying to, to see what, what was going on and um, try to help in ways I could. I kept installing the uh, SETI at home screensaver at my university. Finally, administrators started asking questions. Then I stopped. Now I've just admitted my crime, so there, now you know who it was. Um, but uh, anyways, it was, it was, it's a really a pleasure to be here, and I don't, uh, don't say that lightly. Um, so what, what I'm going to be talking about uh, today is LSST. Um, LSST stands for Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and it's the biggest, it's probably the biggest prob project in uh, U.S. ground-based optical astronomy um, in the next decade or possibly even longer than that. So what LSST is, it is a dedicated survey telescope. So we will build a telescope that will be that will survey half the sky to very deep magnitudes, so 24.5, and do it very quickly. So we'll image the sky once every three days and keep on doing it for 10 years. So we really are building up a movie of the sky. Um, the telescope itself is an integrated survey system. So if you're familiar with telescopes of astronomy, you, you typically think of you know, something that's on the mountain, then an astronomer goes there and sits at a computer, does something, and look at their favorite object and go home. This is not the way this telescope is going to operate. It's practically a robot that sits on top of a mountain, and it does its thing. The way we'll interact with the data from this telescope is through databases. So the, the ultimate deliverable of LSST really is not the telescope nor its instruments. It is the fully reduced data. It is, it is essentially a huge database and a data processing system with a telescope attached. Another key property is that this telescope is not being built by an institution or not even by a consortium of institutions. It's a publicly funded project um, built by, by um, extremely important um, contributions from private money. So from, for example, uh, the Simone Foundation and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to allow us to start this up fairly early. But then most of the investment is coming from the NSF and from the Department of Energy. What that means 
is that there will be absolutely no proprietary period for these data for anyone in the US or in Chile where the telescope is going to be situated. So we're building the telescope, but really it is up to the community, up to everyone from astronomers down to amateurs uh, to make use of the data that's going to sit in the database that we will be building by observing the sky. Why would one want to build something like this? Well, it has, as, as these things go in astronomy, this telescope also has a long history. Um, back in, this started back in the early 90s, believe it or not, and that's 2014 already, so it's kind of scary for those of you who are thinking about getting involved into la in large projects. Um, it started as a dark matter telescope, as a quest to understand two pieces of dark matter. One was cosmology, cosmological dark matter, the thing we believe makes the galaxies go around as fast as they do, and uh, the thing that we believe um, um, makes up 90% um, of, of the matter in the universe. And the other dark matter was the dark, quote unquote dark matter in the solar system, which at the time were Kuiper Belt objects. As if you go back, roll back to, to early to mid 90s, there were very few of those knowns known. What you needed were really deep surveys. This concept evolved through time to what we now know as LSST. Um, what we've discovered is that just by looking at what does it take to build a telescope to do these kinds of these two science cases, well, it turns out that the telescope that you need to build for these two is actually very useful to answer a broad range of science questions. So not just for dark matter and for the Kuiper Belt objects, but also for time domain, so how things evolve in time in the universe, and also for galactic structure. So where, what is our Milky, what does our, our Milky Way look like? Um, how is it created? What are the properties of the star in the, the stars in the Milky Way? So the realization uh, occurred that a single telescope and a single data set can serve to answer all these questions. And that is really what LSST is. It's a machine that will allow a broad range of science to be explored. So I will go through four primary topics of science that we are going to try to address with, with LSST. And just to sort of give you an idea of what, what kinds of things um, are are in store. So one is time domain science. That, that is um, something that has become very, very interesting recently uh, with a number of surveys discovering, for example, most violent or most energetic phenomena in the, in the, in, um, in the universe. Uh, there are these, there are supernovae uh, that are, that are much, at much higher energies than anything we've expected. There are hypernovae. There are there are things such as mergers of stars and black holes, mergers of stars, et cetera, et cetera. All of these requires time domain. So what that means, it requires repeated observations of the same area of the sky, so you can actually see that something's changed. With LSST, we're going to do that. We're going to do it 800 times, actually. The other one is the census of the solar system. We still don't know how many asteroids there are in the solar system or actually we don't know where they are, the asteroids that could uh, you know, send us to join the dinosaurs. Um, that is somewhat disturbing. <laughs> and LSST is being built as a machine that will enable discoveries of these kinds of asteroids and actually make, to make a census of such asteroids, as well as all the other things we have, all the other asteroids we have in the solar system. Another example of what you'll, you'll be able to do with this is mapping the Milky Way. Um, so this is a somewhat complicated plot, but I just want you to concentrate on two things. One is note this very, very inner region. We can barely tell that there's, there's, a, there's something different compared to, to the rest out here. So notice this kind of blue edge. So this is real data from Sloan Digital, Digital Sky Survey, which is currently one of the biggest sky surveys out there. With LSST, we plan to go this far using one kind of tracers. So see this outer circle and then inner circle? And then out as far as the outer circle using a different kind of stars as tracers. And the outer circle here is halfway to Andromeda. So it's halfway to our closest galaxy. So we should be able to, to, to create an extremely detailed map of what's going on in the Milky Way halo. So what, what kind of um, stars are there? How are they positioned? How are they moving? And what does that tell us about how the Milky Way was formed? So what you're seeing here, I said this here is real data. 
this tiny little speck. And what you're seeing out here is simulation. So what I hope to be able to show you in a couple of years from now is the same plot, except that instead of simulation, we will have real data from LSST. So that is the sort of thing that, that we're after. And then finally, one of the biggest questions of today is the one on the nature of dark energy and dark matter. Um, for dark energy, we have many candidates on what it could be. We have very few answers and very few data sets that could be used to test those various hypotheses. LSST has been specifically built to try to answer those questions. It is what's called a stage four dark matter experiment. Um, it will enable us to measure to precisions of a few orders of magnitude greater than the current surveys, uh, whether dark matter is just a cosmological constant, uh, so it's, it's the, the famous lambda term from Einstein's equation, or whether it's something more complicated, more interesting than that. And that is really one of the major drivers of LSST. Take all those areas of science together and ask, what kind of machine do I need to do each and every one of these? And you wind up with the machine that we designed. So it's a wonderful example of how when, you, when you're moving up in the scale of things, so when you're, when you're required to survey a greater and greater volume of the universe, and at, at, at more and more rapid cadence, you suddenly start finding that, that areas of science that you typically think have nothing to do with each other, for example, asteroids and cosmology, have very similar requirements in terms of the instruments we need to build to do them. And so LSST is the sort of investment that will enable many areas of science for basically much less um, funding than you would otherwise need to do if you wanted to do them separately. That's, that's one, of the, one of the really nice things about this project. Um, where do we stand right now? So two years ago, and this was extremely, oh my god, it's four years ago now. <laughs> this, was, this was extremely important. This is an extremely important event for us. Um, Astro 2010, the Cadle survey of the National Scientists, of the National Academy of Sciences, um, has declared um, LSST as ready to go and as a top ground-based priority in US astronomy. Um, so they've, they've agreed with the idea that this really is, has a compelling science case and it has capacity to address all these areas of science and that we should go ahead and build it. So things have, lots of things have happened in, 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 in between. Um, in July 2012, we got the approval from National Science Board to move on to final design. Uh, in February 13, uh, we, were, we appeared in the President's budget request. Uh, in, on December 2nd, so just over a month ago, we passed the NSF Final Design Review, which is a, uh, uh, the last major review that projects of this scale need to pass before being essentially sent to be built. And then we now expect to start construction in July 2014, pending federal budget adoption and the final approval from the National Science Board. So things are looking, looking really, really good right now. Um, in terms of actually building this machine or starting to build this machine in July. And actually things have started looking even better this morning. I got an email at, at 8 a.m. this morning um, saying that LSST has been included in the negotiated budget uh, both the, of the Senate and House Appropriations Committees. And if you know anything about how budget fights go in, in Washington, the fact that you're included in something that's negotiated. Uh, so, so we are really, really happy with how things are unfolding, and we hope to start in, in 2014. Um, who is LSST, and how many people are, are working on this project? On the project, there are on order between 50 and 100 people, depending on, on how you count. But then there's this huge community of astronomers. We have about 400 members of LSST science collaborations who are um, helping us make the science case and understand exactly um, how to choose the filters, how to build the telescope, where to build it, what kind of show, what kind of science can be done with this telescope, et cetera. And it's, it's really amazing because uh, for, for two reasons. One, this is a public resource. So this is a public telescope. There will be no proprietary time. Um, so, so by you know, joining this, this kind of project, you really not just 
helping yourself understand science and understand uh, the universe, but you're helping everyone else. Um, and the second reason is um, these people are doing it essentially in their own free time. Because right now, they're not, we're not funded at the level to support you know, 400 people um, trying to look at, at science cases uh, for something that's, that's half a decade to a decade away. So this level of enthusiasm has always been um, really a, a, a huge deal and, and something to me personally that, that tells me that we're, we're, we're probably doing something right. Where are we going to, where are we going to put it? Um, in 2006, there was a site selection process and site selection committee. And we looked at um, a number of different candidates, both in the Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere in the US and outside of the US. And we picked the, as the best one a mountaintop called Cerro Pachon in Chile, El, El Peñón Peak. So this here is where the LSST site is going to be. This is a, the map, a map of South America. Um, La Serena is down here. And if you, if you know, um, uh, if you're familiar with, with, uh, with the observatories up there, on adjacent peaks, there already is a telescope called SOAR. And there is also an eight meter class telescope called Gemini, Gemini South. Uh, the work has already started there. Um, the private funding that I mentioned that we had over the last couple of years uh, helped us uh, literally to blow up the mountain. Uh, we've, we've leveled the site, so now if you see this white line here, that white line is um, all, the, all the, 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 the rocks and dirt that, that's above that white line is now gone, so the site is ready to, to um, accept the, the, the building and, um, and for, for the actual building to start. Um, once the telescope is built, this is the sort of thing one can expect. So what you're looking at here is a representation of the sky. And what you're seeing is how quickly we're covering that sky through time. So this is over 10 years. As the telescope is observing, observing, observing in different filters, the number of observations grows from, from starting with zero up to 230 or so, depending on the filter. And you'll notice that what we're trying to do is to uniformly cover the southern, um, the southern uh, celestial hemisphere um, to produce a survey that will be roughly 20,000 square degrees uh, to depths of about 27 in, in our band. So with that, when you do the numbers, with that, uh, what that comes out to be, it's, a, it's really a survey of billions, I say here, it's an order of 10 billion objects um, both in space and time. So we'll know where they are, and we'll know what they've been doing over those uh, 10 years. And this is the same, this is the same thing, except that, that um, uh, this is just the final result. Uh, if, in case you're wondering what this is, so what this blue streak is, that is the galactic plane. So in the plane of our galaxy, at, at some point it stops paying off to observe, because the deeper you go, you don't see any deeper. There's so much dust. There are so many stars. It's the crowding just just um, kills you. You cannot you cannot see that deep. So we don't go as uh, we don't observe as frequently in the galaxy. The telescope is not just on the drawing board. We actually started building the mirrors. What you see here is the eight meter primary and tertiary. We have a very interesting um, setup where both the primary mirror and the tertiary mirror are built out of the same piece of glass. And so the primary is actually a ring around here, and then the tertiary is here in the center. So you might see that better down here on, on, on this photo. You can tell how the curvature changes going from here to here. Um, this is probably one of the first times that that's been done, but, but it's, it, it actually uh, turns out to be a fantastic design. And then this here is, uh, is a piece of glass uh, up at Corning uh, that's going to be polished into our secondary. Now that's just, uh, I shouldn't say just glass, it's, it's glass. Um, you also need to attach some electronics to this, for, to this to work. Our camera, when we build it, is going to be the, the largest astronomical camera in existence. It will have 3.2 gigapixels. 
Um, each pixel will cover about uh, two arc seconds. The field of view, which is very important, so we want to observe as much of the sky as possible, as quickly as possible, so we want a telescope with a large field of view. That field of view here is going to be an order of 10 square degrees. And on the same topic, we will be reading out this camera in two seconds. So for those of you who are amateur astronomers and you know, who have CCDs, um, you know that the readouts can take um, you know, anywhere to minutes, depending on, on how you configure it, to, to, to um, minimize your noise, to, to get the image out, that, that, to get the quality of the image that, that you want. We still need to maintain that quality, yet we want to read it out in, in two seconds so that we can go over the sky, over the entire sky, in three days. So the way one does that is by building a camera in a highly segmented fashion. So this camera is not just one big chip. For one, you cannot produce that. It's really 189 chip, chips, and they're, they're, uh, they're housed in these what we call 3 by 3 rafts. So there are nine chips in each raft. Each raft is a 144 megapixel camera. So even by today's standards, one of these rafts would be, one of, would be a, a very powerful astronomical camera. So we have 21 of those. And then each chip itself is then split into 16 segments. Each of these segments is read out independently. So the way this, this, this thing works is it gets read out through a couple of thousand channels simultaneously in two seconds, and we get our 6.4 gigabytes of data out. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting engineering problem to work on. Um, it wasn't clear for quite a long time whether one can actually build a CCD that, uh, that satisfies the sort of flatness specs and the sort of um, um, uh, quantum efficiency specs that, that, we, that, we, had, that we had it, uh, that we needed to have. Uh, but I'm very happy that actually as of last year, we started getting prototypes that satisfy all of our specs and we're ready to start building, start building this, uh, start going into production mode and building these CCDs over the next couple of months. So it's, it's, you might notice that, that, I'm, I'm, that this is all, almost like a victory lap because after 10 years of research and development, you know, things finally start clicking together and you finally get to, to go and start building your telescope. And of course, those of you who have already done big projects will tell me, yeah, this is where the problems begin. <laughs> so I'm kind of enjoying myself while I can. <laughs> um, so this is, again, another view of, of that focal plane. Um, so here's Suzanne Jacoby, our, our um, uh, education public outreach manager, holding it up. This is what the moon would like if uh, we were brave enough to actually go and try to image it. Um, and then this is, again, the layout of the camera. This is one raft. And these are the actual sensors, or actual prototypes uh, that we have in hand right now. And so take all of that together. And this is what one chip of LSST data um, looks like, except that this is not, not real. Right now, it's simulation, which uh, which itself is, is a very um, interesting, uh, albeit, albeit a different story. We actually produce these images by simulating the sky photon by photon and how those photons traverse through the atmosphere, reflect off of the telescope, et cetera. Um, so it's a ray tracing taken to another level. Really fun. All right, so that is the telescope. That is the camera. So what happens then? Um, at the point of the point at which I, I described to you what, what, we're, what we're building, um, we will be getting out hundreds and hundreds of images each night, actually about 2,000 images each night, 2,006.2 gigabyte images. So that's a lot of data. We cannot expect to just dump that somewhere on a website and ask the astronomers, well, now go download it and process it with your favorite <laughs> image processing tool. Um, instead, what we plan to do is to build a data processing system behind it. That data processing system will take those images and turn them into catalogs, which is where probably, you know, nobody really knows the number, but definitely more than 90% or 95% of science are going, is going to come from. Um, that is the role of, of the data management subsystem that, uh, 
that, that I co-lead at, at LSST. We take those images from the telescope, we archive them, we don't want to drop any of the data. We process them to data products, these catalogs that the scientists are going to use to, to actually um, do the science. And we make it available. So that is one of the, the actually, um, it's, it's, it's usually um, not talked about, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. How do you make a petascale database available to both astronomers and the public so that actually you can do that, that sort of science? Um, the Alice's T, in, in geographic terms, the Alice's T is down here in, at Chile. Uh, headquarters right now is at Tucson. And all of the processing is going to be occurring at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, so NCSA, up at Urbana-Champaign in Illinois. So to get the data up there, we will have two long-haul network links. So one going through Brazil and then up to Florida this way, and the other one going in, in, in the other um, um, side of, of uh, North and South America, if you will. And the, the goal here is, since we need to do this in real time, and I'll talk about that in, in just a second, um, if one of these links gets broken, we still have the redundancy, so we can just continue using one link um, until one of the until the other link is repaired. So we really don't want to lose uh, to lose no, nor data or time. Once we get the data up to Illinois, that's where we send it to machines that look like this. So what uh, what's shown here is this is just a, this is a picture of this is a photo of, of the current um, blue water system at, at NCSA. This is their current uh, most powerful petascale machine. We will have a system like this um, in 2018, 2019 that will be taking that data and processing it in real time and then reprocessing it on annual scales. Um, we, right now, we, we're projecting that we will need on order of, of a petaflop of computing power to do this image processing. So this is, when I, when I talk about petascale astronomy, I'm talking about petabytes, I'm talking about petaflops. From the user's perspective, once the data gets, gets up there, it gets turned into catalogs. And then you get three things. Immediately, within 60 seconds, we publish, we look at what, what was in the image, we look at what's changed since the last time we've observed that patch of the sky. And we get that out, get that information out within 60 seconds. So these are what we call time domain alerts or time domain events. So the idea there is that there will be lots and lots of things that will be changing in the sky where you need, where you want to know it, that something changed right away. So that you can go follow it up to do spectroscopy or you know, follow it up with a with, um, telescope of similar size if it's moving, say if it's an asteroid. So we have this level one processing that will be running continuously and within 60 seconds of each, observations, of each observation, it will be putting out an alert saying, something in the sky has changed there. These are its properties. You, the astronomer, or actually your computer program, figure out if, it's, if this is important or not and maybe redirect other telescopes, go look in the same direction. Um, the projection is that we'll be generating about 10 million of these per night. So what you're seeing here, again, there aren't, as you probably are aware of, there aren't 10, 10 million telescopes on Earth, um, at least not 10 million that are big enough to be doing follow-up for LSST. So we will need to winnow down these 10 million to perhaps a couple of hundred to have any chance of actually following them up. Now, that is a really difficult problem. It's a problem of classification. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a problem where we'll need to start talking to um, um, people in other areas of science, um, statisticians, uh, machine learning experts, etc. And this is actually a problem that, that we need to solve. It's still not quite clear how one, will, how one is going to do that uh, before LSST goes, goes on the sky. Within these 10 million time domain events, um, or out of these 10 million time domain events, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to catalog orbits in the solar system. So we expect to have an order of 6 million of those. Um, and to give you an idea, that is about, that should result in, in us cataloging approximately 85% of asteroids bigger than 130 meters, which is, which is the famous um, congressional 
mandate to NASA um, to find uh, killer asteroids. Um, now, there are things, there are other things that, that we're interested in for science that are not that time sensitive, but that require higher precision and, and better processing of data. That is what's going to be happening each year in what we call level two. Um, so what level two is, it's processing where the computers take all the information that we have and then construct the best possible, um, I'm going to say image, but I don't want that to be misunderstood, construct the best possible representation of what's out there in the universe. So what, is, what are the, the brightnesses of certain objects, exactly where they are, whether they're moving, how they're moving, et cetera. So this is not just based on one observation, but based on all observations that we have. If you add more observations, then your certainty increases. This will be happening on an annual time scale, and this will result in a catalog of about 40 billion objects, um, roughly half and half distributed between stars and galaxies. And each of those objects will be, will be observed on order of a couple hundred to thousand times. So we're talking about 7 trillion observations and 30 trillion measurements. And all of those get put in a database, and they're made available um, online. Now, the, the final third piece of the puzzle is how are you going to actually get all this data and, and, and do something with it? Um, one answer is you're going to ask us to FedEx you a box of hard drives uh, with a the, the couple of petabytes of catalogs on them. And that's actually a valid answer. Um, because if you look at how computing trends, where computing trends are going and where storage trends are going, um, having a couple of petabytes at home, by home I mean probably your home institution or research group, is not going to be a, a huge showstopper in the 2020s. But nevertheless, if you don't want to do that, another way to approach this, a uh, probably more cost-effective way to approach this, is to instead take computing to the data. So you will take your program, your code that you want to run on the data, and run it at LSST data center. And that is what this level three processing is. It is us opening up our infrastructure and our, our computing capabilities that we have in the data center that are typically used for producing alerts and for producing catalogs uh, to the user community so they can run their own stuff there. So it, it's sort of like moving your, your work and computing from your home institutions into the cloud, where um, in this case, your cloud provider is us, is LSST. Uh, now I have a couple of slides on what's going to be in, in these various data products, and I'm just going to go through that quickly. I just, the, the thing that I want you to, to get a feel for is what kind of information we, we're planning to put out. So if, if you're a scientist interested in, in this sort of thing, you can, you can come to me and, and we can um, chat about this more in detail. So in level one, uh, the transient alerts, I already said that these are, these are the, the alerts that get um, emitted within 60 seconds of observation. The idea here is, here's an object, something's changed. Here's all the information we know from LSST about that object. So its position, its flux size and shape, it's light curves, so what has it been doing uh, since the start of the survey? Uh, what does it look like in terms of variability? And also little images centered on that, on that object. And the idea here is you will take that, you'll feed it to your machine learning uh, classifier or whatever kind of classifier you come up with, and that classifier will tell you, well, here's one in a thousand object that you probably want to follow up with an eight meter class telescope and, and take a spectrum of it. Uh, so we'll be putting out the stream um, continuously through the night, and I don't recall the exact number, but I think it's something on order of, it's, it's about on order of, of four gigabits per second that'll be coming out of, of NCSA carrying this data. Um, solar system objects, for solar system objects, we actually plan not just to observe them, but to identify which one is which. It's a difficult problem, because when you make an observation, most of your solar system objects are not trailed. So they just look like a star that actually has a spectrum of the sun, think about that for a second, um, that just appeared there. Then in, in your next image, you know, a couple of days later, you see that quote unquote star having moved somewhere else. But there's just not, not just one, there are thousands of them. And then the question is, which one is which? It's a combinatorially difficult problem. Um, 
And we're actually spending a lot of computing power to, to disentangle that and figure that out. Because we, we only see them appearing. We don't see which way they're moving. And they all look the same. On, at, at level two, we'll be producing annual data releases. So if you've worked with astronomical catalogs before, you, you already know what's going to be in this. If you've worked with something like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or if you looked at the images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this is going to be very similar, except for one crucial difference that um, we're, the volume of data is going to be much, much higher. Uh, the numbers are down here. I'm going to read them. Um, and the other difference is that the precision with which we plan to measure uh, certain things is going to be an order, an order of magnitude higher than what's typical for um, optical astronomy today. Now, the challenge with this, as I mentioned, is how do we, how do we get that out to, to, to the end users? Uh, we're developing a distributed database to do that. And actually, it's being developed down the road from here at Slack. Um, we're having um, a, a fair amount of success at the leveraging the fact that, that you know, our team is here right in the center of Silicon Valley, and, and we're communicating to various firms who are working on, on these sorts of things and, and these sorts of um, databases. And then we're going to have a user interface on top of that that will enable you to, to, get, to get to the data um, and, and to, to access it. Um, what I'm showing here is, is a current mock-up uh, that's, that's a web user interface, but we're very much aware how technology changes and changes rapidly. So we're going to have at least two or three generations of these until we settle on the final one, as this telescope is supposed to, uh, to start observing in early 2020s, and it'll observe for decades afterwards. So we don't want to be building for something that will be outdated at the point of deployment. Um, and this is about level three. Let me, let me skip that in, in just a time. Um, our current status uh, in terms of software is that we, we actually built about 60% of, of, or prototype about 60% of, of the code that, that we plan to be using. Um, and we already have a, what's a rapidly maturing state-of-the-art astronomical data system. We've been, we've, been, we've been applying it to previous surveys. So this here is an example of uh, reprocessed data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. What I'm showing here are just dots. There are so many of them. The, one, each dot represents one object in the catalog. This is a right ascension. This is a declination. So this is a, one stripe of the sky. There are so many of them that you cannot tell that they're dots. It just looks like everything is black. Um, it's all public. That's maybe one thing that we want to mention. And we can actually go deeper than Sloan did with these new reprocessings. Uh, it's a, this is a very busy plot, but the, the, the thing to, to see is that the, the red line and the blue lines are higher than the gray line. That's all we need to know at this point are higher and more to the right. So it basically tells us that, that we can go deeper. Um, and now this is really the, the one that I, was, that I should have shown immediately. Um, just wondering if we could turn the lights down just for a second. So that is what, uh, what you get when you take about 80 images of the same region of the sky taken with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and then you co-add them in a, with an algorithm that uh, that, that we invented that preserves these backgrounds. So you suddenly start seeing streams or dust lanes in our Milky Way galaxy. That's what you see here. This here is M2. It's a globular cluster. Um, what I'm showing you here is a, an extremely zoomed out version of the original image. If you zoom in, you start recognizing individual stars in, in the halo up here, and you start Seeing around these small, some of these smaller galaxies, you start seeing streams of disrupted galaxies around them. And if you want to, to do that exploration, just go to this address. So moastrowashingtonedu slash sdss. And I, I, I'm sure that these slides are going to be posted somewhere, so you don't have to be retyping that URL right now. You can come back to it later on. There we have a nice sort of Google Maps-ish type interface that allows you to 
scroll through it, zoom in, zoom out, etc. Um, the code, just as the data, is going to be all open source, and it'll be freely available to everyone. It's actually GPL uh, version 3 licensed. Um, right now, it runs on, on uh, Macs and, and uh, uh, usual uh, Linux configurations. Um, but I just want to add one warning here, because I, I realize there, there are probably many astronomers, many amateurs and professionals in the audience who would love to try to get it thinking, oh, well, this is the, the, the latest and greatest. But one thing to note is this is not still finished, polished, ready to use end user product. So you're not going to be greeted by a nice command line interface or even a nice, um, or nice graphical user interface. This is the sort of thing that you want to download if you're building a survey. Um, we're, we're not at the stage yet where we would just put it out for anyone to use. So you're downloading unsupported code and it will not work, of the box, uh, work out of the box for cameras other than Analysis T and SDSS. Uh, but if you're a graduate student who's, who's looking to get involved in Analysis T and who's looking to understand the algorithms and uh, or just interested how these things work, how these things work, um, this, this is a nice thing to, to download and try out. Okay. Um, so I wanted to spend the last uh, five to ten minutes speaking about what I think think is are the challenges for us to get this LSST vision of one telescope, one database, and lots of lots of science to make it a reality. Um, I think we've, we as a project have successfully now jumped through various hoops and, and over many hurdles to get this project designed and, and to the state where it's ready to actually be built. And we, we really do expect that we will start building it in July of this year. It will take us about um, six years to first light. It, it is a big telescope. It takes a while to build. It will take us then two years to commission the telescope so that we know that the quality of data is, is good enough. And then it will start and it will operate for 10 years. And what we're hoping is that when we start on that day one, um, we will have, as the data stream gets published to the world, lots and lots of good signs start coming out of it right away. Now, obstacles to that are technological. We need to build a telescope. But they're also sociological. Because we as astronomers are not used to working with machines like this. So uh, let's think about astronomy through, through the ages. I mean, we were traditionally a really, really data start science. right? It used to be the case that there were many theories, but there was no data to, to prove them or disprove them. It also used to be the case that um, if you had the telescopes, that was the key differentiator for making it or not. Because then you can actually go and observe what needed to be observed to prove or disprove a certain theory or even put up a hypothesis. So our methods and approach to research were shaped by this environment. And now surveys suddenly are altering it dramatically. Because suddenly we're in a, we're in a position where data is becoming abundant. I mean, it's... We don't realize it, but we're in that position right now. There are, there, are, there are so many things out there in archives that no one has ever looked at um, or you know, even tried to process in, in, a, in some uniform fashion um, that, that it's just astounding. And with LSST, it's going to become um, even worse or better, depending on your point of view. <laughs> so uh, we're talking about these sorts of numbers. So our final image collection um, is going to be hundreds of petabytes. Databases are going to be tens of petabytes. You know, we're going to have final disk storage available in a data center. There's going to be, again, hundreds of petabytes, et cetera. Um, so lots and lots of data. It's a really a quantitative difference. But it's also a qualitative difference because th these data are not just going to be, it's not just going to be much of it, but it's also going to be very precise. So what I'm showing you here is a comparison of um, nine hours in CFHT, this is a four-meter class telescope, and this is looking at, at one dwarf galaxy uh, close to the Milky Way. And then this is the same thing with a single epoch, so 30 seconds with LSST. This is simulated. And then this is 200 epochs, so this is after 10 years. And the numbers to look at is the y, the, the, the thing to look at is the y-axis. So the y-axis here goes to you know, 24 cuts off here. 
And what else is T24 cuts off here? And 24 in single epoch cuts off here. So suddenly, we're going to replace nine hours on a, on a very, very good telescope uh, that has excellent conditions with an order of 30 seconds to, to a minute on LSST for free in a database already processed. So this is a slide that I saw when I was in graduate school. Um, and the, the idea of this was that, um, you know, these guys are theorists. And I, I, I studied at Princeton, and we, we didn't go to telescopes quite often. But now with this situation where, you, where suddenly you have the entire sky funneled into a giant database, observers are getting into the same position. So we both, um, we as a community need to start acknowledging that, that we're entering an age of abundance of high quality data and that our success in research will now suddenly start to depend on the ability to mine knowledge from that data, not the ability to acquire data. So it doesn't matter that you have the biggest telescope anymore because everybody else has access to that database as well. What really matters now is do you have a good idea and do you have the, the knowledge, the know-how, how to get into the database and extract the data out? And I bet that some of the most interesting science for LSST, although I talked about many you know, different areas, has not even been imagined. And we have proofs of that in past history. What I'm showing you here is what's called the field of streams from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. These are remnants of dwarf galaxies that got torn apart as they approached the Milky Way. Uh, these, are, these, are, these remnants tell us a lot about the history and the structure of the Milky Way and its formation. If you go back 10 years before that and look at the, the LSST um, design books, you will not see this mentioned. This was not envisioned. So we expect these sorts of things to happen with LSST as well, that once people start going through that database, we'll start finding new and new important things. All right, so what does one do to become equipped to deal with, in, to, to, to deal with this sort of environment? How does one become a data-driven astronomer? Well, for one thing, you need to know what question to ask, so your horizons must expand. I mean, the standard we have right now is you're working on a certain hypothesis and you ask, what data do I have to collect to prove or disprove it? Well, now we're going to be in a position where we actually have lots of data already. So another approach to research may be, what theories can I test given data I already have? But for that, you need to be broad. So as an example of that, let me show you this slide. These are, these are asteroids out here. This is large scale structure. This here is dust in the Milky Way, map of dust in the Milky Way. And this here is map of metallicity in the Milky Way with a with a, a, a giant stream that's hiding in here. These were all made by a single person. And although this is a wide, this is a fairly wide, uh, broad swath of science, what, what's common amongst these is that they're all made using data from the Solon Digital Sky Survey. My, my second um, point will be to emphasize that our primary task as astronomers is not going to be to analyze data or to search for an interesting thing. It will be to teach the computer to do it for us because there will be so much of it that it's just going to be impossible to do manually. There are, there are many, many institutions and places where graduate students still um, <coughs> spend a lot of their time and days just looking through images and clicking and, and you know, measuring manually, et cetera. That's not going to work. That's, that's out of the question for, at, at these scales. You will need to know how to write code you will need to know statistics. We will need to know how to interface large databases and do that sort of analytics to do astronomy. So to go back to my examples of science, um, if I now replace them with the method of getting to that science, <coughs> I challenge you if you're an astronomer in the audience to go, through, to go through these and count up how many of them you've encountered, how many of them you know, uh, how many of the methods you know, and how many uh, are, are new to you. So this is, this is all emphasizing how statistics and machine learning, and in some cases artificial intelligence techniques are starting to become important for us. So finally, to, to cap that transition, I think another thing that we're going to have, have to admit to ourselves and make sure we teach our students 
is that software engineering will become as essential as mathematics. If you think about it, um, there isn't a physicist in the world today who would, who would say that they don't need mathematics to do physics, right? It's a tool that we use. When we need to add two numbers, we don't go to the expert in the math department to tell us how to do that. So we need to, we in, unfortunately, currently in, 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 in our community, we, we have sort of a problem where software is not taken as seriously. So there we think, why well, are we going to hire software engineering? He's going to write that program for me. Well, it's, it's, it's not going to work except for the, the, the absolutely simplest challenges that one can imagine. So I really believe that we need to start teaching this. We need to start, um, you know, when we, when we get our Astro you know, 101 classes, where we get our, our Astro grad students, we'll need to start teaching them software and not just expect them to, to pick it up by osmosis. You know, how to write it, how to write maintainable code, um, what are all these databases that we're talking about, what is SQL, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, that is the sort of thing that I think is going to have to, have to come along. And um, at one point, I took this snapshot of, of a certain person's bookshelf. Um, when, when I realized that I had only two astronomy books on it. <laughs> and I had a title of a Hubble fellow, which is an astronomer. Um, but I think this is really the reality. The sort of things that we'll need to, to, to learn and know to be able to thrive in this age of large surveys expands much beyond astronomy. And it's an interesting change. It's going to be a difficult change, but it's going to be one that I think ultimately will make astronomy stronger, will make physics stronger, and it will also let our graduate students influence other fields as well. So on, on that note, I will stop and thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to start with the probably obvious question, being uh, that you're here at the SETI Institute and you've held back from uh, talking about SETI applications, but surely you must have crossed your mind coming on the uh, plane here. Can you start us off with some ideas on SETI-related applications? So th there are a couple of things. Um, what this is is... Imagine having half the sky, and, and that half the sky has been observed a thousand times. So the sorts of things you can do is you can try to do a mini optical study, if you will. Actually, maxi optical study, now that I think about it. Um, where you're looking at whether you're seeing certain kind of variability from, from certain objects um, that is just inconsistent with what we would expect from uh, nature. Um, the other sort of thing that, that you might be looking for is are objects with spectra that are inconsistent with nature, um, with, or in our case, colors, because we, we, were, we just had broadband filters. Um, so I would start thinking about looking for anomalies, really. You're, you're looking for things that, that don't, that are not supposed to exist. So you either fi find an extremely interesting physical phenomena, phenomenon, or you will find something that might be worth following up with you know, radio telescope or, or paying more attention to that object more closely um, in the context of, of study searches. So in, in, in either case, you win. Sounds like a pretty amazing tool you have there. Um, could you say something about how you're going to calibrate it? Yes. Uh, calibration is, is, is an issue always. So we're going to, to do two things. One is there's a, a method called self-calibration that has been um, applied to Sloan first. The idea there is that you try to observe each patch of the sky as many times as possible with different parts of your detector. So the optimal case is that every star is observed with every s amplifier um, on, our, on every CCD. So uh, what that lets you do is then you solve a big matrix where basically you take all the stars that, that um, are not varying, um, and you do this iteratively, so you don't need to know that they're not varying in advance, and ascribe any variations to calibration to differences in, in, in zero points at, at the detectors. So this has been applied on, on SDSS, 
it works wonderfully. It works so well that actually for final SDSS calibrations, the, 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 the calibrations from the calibration telescope that was sitting by and doing observations were not used at all. And if you think about it in information theoretical context, it makes sense because the, the calibration telescope will never acquire nowhere near the amount of data and the amount of bits of information that your survey will. So if you adjust your survey strategy so that, that information is useful for calibration as well as science, then you can, you can win a lot. Um, that will depend on how well our detectors perform. So it can go from anywhere from a couple of thousands to tens of thousands. But on the other hand, we will have about 5 million observations or 5 million images by the end of the survey. So there's, there's more than enough uh, data there to, to, to constrain them. What's the, uh, the spectral resolution that you plan to have? I, I remember you mentioned uh, your uh, filters are fairly broadband. Mm -hmm. um, filters are UGRIZY um, like in, in Sloan, so that's a few hundred nanometers. So it's, it's um, I think I have, do I have, no, I, I don't. So if you look up Sloan filters, you, you'll, you'll get an idea. So it ranges from about, I think, 150 nanometers to about 300. Um, yeah. um, the telescope is supposed to have a lifetime or it should have a lifetime of decades, right? Plural. And we're beginning as a community to learn that the bigger telescope is not always the better, but a smaller telescope with better back-end instrumentation, which is the way you're going. So how long before you can think about replacing the camera s system? And how long before you can get to milliseconds mm -hmm. for astrophysical or nanosecond for SETI time scales? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Um, so to answer your, your first question, I think we, uh, the, the, the duration of the survey is driven largely by dark energy and by uh, Milky Way science, so proper motions. The, the longer the baseline, we, we, we get better proper motions. Um, my guess is that somewhere at the midpoint of the survey, so five years in or so, people will start, actually probably earlier than that, people will start proposing for new instrumentation, new cameras, and what to do with this telescope once it's out. Um, the, the, the typical things that, um, that one could imagine is putting in a different filter. So putting in, say, an age alpha filter, putting in a, those are the sort of relatively cheap things that you can do to modify this instrument to, to make it last longer. Um, I think it's still too early to talk about, ser more seriously about you know, what to do. And the reason is technology. So this will happen in 2025. The, the replacement is going to happen in 2030. Um, for all I know, we might have photon counting detectors at that point, and, and so I think it's sort of too early to, to imagine that. In terms of how, how short we can go in cadence, um, right now we can go to about a second. So if we, we, we typically observe 15 second, 15 second exposures, but, but the shutter can actually open in a second, and we're looking uh, through some value engineering if we can get that down to a tenth of a second. So for sort of one-off projects or smaller projects that, that may want to, to, do, to, look, to do, look at that sort of resolution, uh, we may be able to support it. But we're far from nanoseconds or milliseconds. You mentioned that with the data that's available, you will now need to, folks will now need to, rather than pose their own question, teach the machine to, figure out the question and go and find the answer. And you talked about the fact that astronomers haven't put as much emphasis on computing software, writing software, software engineering, as they yeah. might, yeah, as they might. So can you talk a little bit more about how you think that, how's, how are you gonna bridge that? How's that gonna happen? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so, so just to, to, to maybe um, slightly correct myself if I misspoke, the, we will still be asking the questions. It is that we will then need to teach the computer to look for answers to those questions. Um, we will not be looking at that manually ourselves. So, so that is what I, what I wanted to convey with that. So that means being able to write the code to, to do it. Now, how are we going to teach our students, um, or how are we going to, to impress on our students the importance of this? I think it will really depend on, on individual institutions and what they choose to teach. 
Um, this is this is the sort of thing where where you know, the, the the faculty who are involved with large survey they quickly figure it out and and realize oh I cannot do this unless I have this sort of expertise and the students that I have don't have the sort of expertise therefore I need to teach it um, I've seen this in institutions that have been involved with large surveys um, unfortunately those are institutions such as you know. Princeton or Harvard or Cal Caltech in some cases. Um, the great promise of LSST is that, that it will be completely open. So even smaller institutions will be able to jump in it. And I think it's really for those institutions where it's, where it's important that, that they get this message and, and start training their students and or hiring faculty that, that, that sort of knows this so that they're competitive once a telescope like this comes out. I mean, the way we, we, we're sort of limited as, as LSST to project what we can do because we're primarily the project to build a telescope. But one thing that we can do is to talk about this and you know, to give examples of what we've done in previous surveys where this has shown to be true, to give people code to actually um, play with these sorts of things. And so if, if, if there, are, there are people interested uh, in, in you know, talking to us about what we feel will be necessary for, to make LSST a success, then that's the sort of thing that, that we're going to do. We're, we want to disseminate information as much as we can. Hi, over here. So a uh, sysadmin kind of um, a question. I saw on one of the slides where you talked about the data going from South America to NCSA, uh, there was a, a note for like copy two of the data. And so I'm wondering uh, what your, whether you're having like offsite backups um, and what your long-term data storage and integrity plan is, um, not just in terms of, you know, mean time between failure of, of hard disks, but also, you know, security so that some prankster doesn't come in and insert little green men into the data or yeah. something. <laughs> Uh, so, so let me go through that one by one. Um, we will have at least three copies of data, actually four. Uh, so one will be at, in Chile in La Serena, uh, one will be at NCSA. Uh, there is an off-site backup from NCSA and I honestly I don't know where it is. It's, it's their institutional off-site that they're already using. And there will also be a copy in France and Paris because one of the, the uh, the, the more recent developments has been that, that I2P3, the French uh, High Energy Institute, has, has gotten involved in the project, so they'll be doing some of the processing as well. Um, the, uh, having copies is nice, but it's, you need to continually verify that they're, they're integrity. So we'll be doing that. We'll be reprocessing these data on, on annual timescales, and we will also be um, you know, just rerunning through, through all the data and computing checksums and making sure that nothing has changed. Uh, regarding security, um, the thing that we worry about is not so much that someone will get in and get access to the data because we make it public. So that's good. The thing that we worry about is someone is going to go come in and do rm-rf slash or, or equivalent thereof. And you know, we will have to deal with it in, in with the same techniques that are being used um, today and that, that will be in place in 2020s. We have um, a cybersecurity team, um, uh, a person whose you know, only job in LSST is to make sure that nobody breaks in and deletes our data. And there's really no, not, not a good you know, single answer to this sort of thing. It's really industry standard practices and being vigilant. Um, just the same collection of issues in banking and finance? Yep. Bob, we'll um, wait until, we'll, I'll get to you, Bob, in just a sec. Um, before we get our second last question now, um, I just want to advertise that in May we'll be having a talk um, on uh, looking through the SDSS for SETI Dyson spheres as well. So come back for that if you're interested in the survey topic, Dave. That was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in near-Earth asteroids. At the beginning, that was for a while one of the primary objectives, but it, since they're very fast moving, as you know, it requires probably different cadences and different return times. Is that still in the, the plan? So the, it, it still is. Um, it turns out that the cadence, 
it depends on what one wants to do, right? If you're satisfied with finding 85% of the 130 meter ones, then the, that's what the current cadence gives you. If you want to bump that up to 90% to, to you know, satisfy the official mandate, then that requires a change in cadence which we think would extend the survey uh, by about a year or two. Um, so there, there is some cost in there. We're, we're looking, and the question is if, if you're, there are two ways to approach this. If, if you care about the science, then the difference between 85% and 90% is zero. Um, if you care about planetary defense, well, one could argue that it's not zero, but it's not that different from zero. Um, it it's really will depend on, on what we want to do or, or what the, the, the various um, stakeholders want to do when the telescope is actually on the sky. Right what now. I'm wondering is, do you have actual time blocks with different cadence no, for them? No. Okay. This is one. Oh, sorry, I misunderstood. This is one cadence that will that will do do this. We have 10% of the time allocated for different cadences for experiments, different cadences, etc. But the asteroids come out of this universal cadence. Let's see. I'll try and sneak in a couple of questions. Uh, let, uh, uh, let's see, they both, both should be pretty easy to answer. Uh, one of them is uh, your search algorithms. It strikes me that some of them will be sort of routine questions that you have, like what's moved every three days, looking, looking for asteroids and so on and so forth, kinds of searches that you want to run routinely, so kind of untouched by human hands. And then, and perhaps there's a spectrum from brand new questions, brand new searches, to the kind of boilerplate searches that, that you routinely run. So uh, uh, do you want to answer that one first? Um, there is. If you look at, so the, the way I interpret the question is, is the complexity of queries that we're going to be getting against our database. There will be routine queries that, that one does all the time that are fairly simple in nature. And there will be things that are more complicated. And the answer is yes. Um, we've seen that in Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The, the distribution of queries there is actually something like 1 over f. So you have lots and lots of quick queries that are, that are tiny that, that end, that return quickly. And then you have um, a number of, it's much smaller number of queries that take up a lot of time. So we expect to, to have the same thing in LSST and we're designing the system to, to support that sort of workload. Mm -hmm. and, and my second question is, uh, with a community project like this, it strikes me as being an easy way for non-participating countries, and here I have in mind China uh, in particular, it's really, really interested in boosting their, their international image in terms of science. Uh, are you seeing interest from them, other Asian countries? Um, there, there are various... Russia. So th there have been expressions of interest for, from about 70 uh, different institutions um, all across the world. Um, and I'm, I'm actually not sure about the, the specific, uh, whether we have any in China. But as a country, we have not been, they have not approached us yet as perhaps to, to buy into the survey or um, to, to, to get access to the data. I mean, th that is one good point. When I say the data is going to be public, note that I qualified it and said it's going to be public to the US to everyone in, in the US and Chile, and actually these international partners. Um, as you can imagine, and, and the project this scale, this is, a, this is the question that, that is way beyond my pay grade. It involves reci reciprocity. It involves um, you know, paying for costs in, in operations, uh, paying for some operation costs, et cetera. But uh, from my point of view as, as a scientist, I think that the more we can disseminate these data and make them public, the more science we're going to get out. So truly, my hope really is that, that we can come to some agreement with the rest of the world where our data is completely public, their data is completely public, and then may the best science win. OK, Mario, um, we have a uh, special SETI.org slash talks uh, mug. Uh, there's some aliens on there. Perhaps the LSST is Excellent. going to be nice. uh, able to detect those uh, in the near future. Oh. Please join me in thanking Mario for his fabulous talk. Thank you.